Hi, I'm Tim Kilduff, and this is Business Matters. Business Matters is HKM show focusing not only on businesses in Hopkinton, but more importantly, the people who run and manage these businesses. Today I have with me Dennis Cates and Michael Massione of Hopkinton Drug. Gentlemen, thanks for taking the time. I want to jump into this because um, this is a um, more complex discussion, I think, than first meets the eye. And uh, let me start by saying, if we don't finish, we may have to have you back. Uh, because uh, in, in, in discussing Hopkins and Drug uh, with you prior to uh, this discussion, I began to get a greater understanding for the role that the, that the, the company has taken over the years in, uh, in some of the positions it's taken, like, like stopping to sell tobacco pr uh, products many years before other people finally caught on to that. But Dennis, I think it would be a mistake if we didn't pay uh, due respect to the founder of the company. Um, it, it, I'd love to have you talk a little bit about uh, your dad and the, and the operation uh, he built in Hopkinton. Okay, well, uh, my dad, uh, uh, his name was Edward H. Cates. Um, he, he enjoyed pharmacy. He, he very much enjoyed pharmacy and very much enjoyed uh, the community of Hop Hoppington. It was a small town, a very small town. Yeah. I think it was 2,300 people back then. Wow. I think, I think wow. the road, the Main Street Road was paved for one or two years before he started. I, don't hold me to that number, but it was, it was um, very early on. Uh, he started the operation in 1954. Uh, he passed on in 1980. Uh, his passion was his passion was pharmacy. He was a, he was a smart guy and he was a very caring guy. Uh, we still have people coming in today saying, you know, uh, how kind and how considerate and um, how supportive he was for people when um, when nobody else was there to care, nobody else was there to support them. Um, it's very humbling. It really is. Yeah, I can imagine, Michael. What's your role? I'm the sales and marketing director for our company. And I uh, came on board uh, back in, uh, I think, early midsummer of 2009. And uh, at the time, it was, a, uh, is and, uh, was and still is a thriving business. Uh, we were more localized and regionalized at the time. And, and over the past seven years, it's been quite a journey. Uh, we've taken our, our business to the national level. Um, not to forget our community, we, we try to do a lot of things such as uh, an annual lecture series, open houses, community events. Uh, this is important to us that people know that uh, um, you know we're, we're in the community, we're in the town, and, and this is where our home is, and we care about it very much. Um, and also to mention that uh, um, you know, we're on a national level, and, and we care and take care of people far and wide. Let, I want to come back to that. Let's talk a little bit about, um, uh, about there's more to Hopkins and Drug than first meets the eye. It's, it appears to be a more complex operation than people first. Well, we have the, we have the traditional pharmacy, right. um, but we also have a very um, complex and very um, invested uh, interest in compounding. Uh, we do a lot of compounding for veterinary, for veterinary purposes. Actually, this is a very large portion of our business because, let's face it, there's animals that just won't take medications and they're, they're too small for manufactured products. So we do a lot of that. We work very closely with the vets. We listen to what they have to say. And part of the challenge, part of the complexity of Hopkinton drug and especially the compounding is many times we're asked to create things that haven't been created before. Um, for example, um, uh, we had a patient that was uh, having a problem with a thing called, it's called lick granuloma uh, in, a, in, a, in a pet. It's a, it was a dog. Uh, it is a dog. And um, the animal, you know, they, they, they use the cones, but somehow this animal was able to get out of the cones. So we had to find a way to um, increase the healing rate and uh, help the animal not continue to lick and keep the wound open. And you know, by doing a little study and taking a little time and doing a little experimentation and searching the literature, we were able to develop it. And we were able to work with some veterinarians 
um, that we're able to validate our thinking and the product was developed and the product's working and it's very effective. Uh, so that's, that's very unique. It's, it's, it's an invention. It's an invention. When you, uh, when you both got into your respective uh, professions, what kind of training did you have? Uh, I had a traditional uh, training from uh, Massachusetts College of Pharmacy. Um, uh, I didn't really have any, I didn't have much formal training. My father did train me on some compounding, uh, and it was much more pervasive back when he first started his practice. Um, but by the time I was graduated from college, it was basically um, mostly manufactured products we were dispensing. And then um, over the course of time, we found out that you know more and more needs weren't being met by manufactured products, uh, such as allergens in, in the medications, or the right dosage form wasn't there, or the correct uh, concentration wasn't there, or the taste wasn't pleasant. And so um, I found a company that could help get me trained and understand uh, what we needed to, to do and what we, how we needed to do this and the science behind it. Uh, that company was called Professional Compounding Centers of America. That is a commercial operation. Uh, I got a lot of training from there, but a lot of the training came from um, being on, being belonging to groups, um, uh, on listservs. You know, uh, these 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 blogs, talking to other professionals. What do you do? How are you doing that? How? Uh, why do you think this works? Why didn't that work? Um, there's a lot to it. There's a lot. It's not just a nine-to-five job. It's a, it's a, it's a career. Michael, how about you? So I came from. Uh, um, I went to school uh, uh, for uh, marketing and business, and uh, through my career, in one form or another, I've been involved with uh, sales and marketing. Uh, but as I, I joined Hopkinton Drug. Um, I really didn't have a, a great knowledge of compounding and what it, it, what it was. So um, I basically, through on-the-job training and, and jumping in, attending conferences and training sessions and um, online uh, uh, types of trainings and surrounding myself uh, and being around people such as Dennis in the lab, um, I had to become a quick study. Uh, and so I brought the sales and marketing background to uh, this industry, which I didn't have a, a great knowledge of to start with, but to quickly learn. And uh, so it's, it's an ongoing training, as Dennis mentioned, um, with the vast number of compounds and the things that you need to learn on a daily basis uh, as disease states change and uh, health conditions change, uh, treatments change, uh, we're, we're forever learning. and. Uh, uh, that's that's how I got to this point. The um, w what do you spend um, both? W what do you what do you spend most of your time doing? And then the I'm interested in the the kind of uh, where the real pressure points are in the business. Where the 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 largest, the biggest challenges lie. Oh boy. Um, so what do I spend most of my time doing? I spend a lot of my time listening to what patients' needs are. Mm -hmm. it, 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 that, that and doctors, actually, the doctors or the patients will contact uh, the drugstore uh, and will hear what their needs are. You know, and, and so we're, we're, we're a resource. We're a resource for physicians. We're a resource for patients. Um, where can they go? Who can they see? What products are available? How can we address what's not being addressed? That's what we do. The, the pressure point is developing the product that we need to develop as quickly as possible and getting it out to the patients. Once a patient gets a order for medication, they want it as fast as possible. And, and that's, that's, a big, that's a big pressure source. Um, you know, sometimes deflating the expectations. Uh, the other day we had a formulation we were working on and we had to redo it 15 times. It just wasn't working out. Uh, we needed to have it as a solution, and it was working out to be a suspension and a with a precipitate. It wasn't usable. Wow. So we had so we had to you know figure out what what were we doing wrong, how can we fix it, uh, and then we have to send it out for testing. And testing takes time too. Uh, regulations, safety, those are big, big, big pressure points. 
this uh, regulations, uh, you, you both have to, I would imagine, there's going to be a, some regulator up here in the sky. Federal, state? But federal, state, yeah. Uh, both. Uh, so recently, I think it was about, a, I think last month, the Board of Pharmacy in Massachusetts came in and did an inspection. Uh, very pleased to report we have no deficiencies whatsoever. Um, they they won't claim it, but uh, they said that we're probably one of the the better pharmacies uh, that they inspect. Wow! So I take you know that's unofficial, but I, yeah, I take it. I take it. You know, I'm proud of that. I'm very proud of that. Yeah, well, yeah, you should be. Continuing education on both your parts <coughs> must be much much eat up a fair amount of time. The legal requirement for me is 20 continuing hours of education, uh, and some of it is, has to be compounding, some of it has to be law, uh, some of it has to be regular general pharmacy practice. Um, but I'd say that 20 hours is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, that's what we have to document. Right. Probably, probably 20 hours a week is what we're, we're spending easily. Uh, outside of probably outside of the not probably but outside of just doing our job uh, so you know there's the nine to five or I shouldn't say nine to five it's actually nine to seven right uh, and then we're in Sundays trying to catch Saturdays and Sundays at trying to catch up because th there's a lot of work to do and it has to be done right if it's not done right it's got to be done again what are the other parts of the of the drugstore uh, that you have to uh, be concerned with I mean, you have staff. That's got to. That's got to take time and effort and energy. Mm -hmm. How many people employed? I think there's uh, between forty-three and forty-nine. Really? Yeah. Full time and part time. So it, there's, there's there's quite a few people. My guess is people wouldn't wouldn't come close to guessing that number. No, they wouldn't. And you don't see all the staff that right. are employed there all at once either. And plus, if, it, if people haven't ever been into the store, it's, it's quite large. And uh, people are hidden in little corners doing their job. Uh, and uh, of course, seasonally, the numbers change as well. Uh, we add to the staffing uh, requirements through the summer months and things like that. Uh, also, you know, um, Behind the walls, if you will, there's a lab back there, and a significant amount of people work back in that lab as well. Yeah, I wouldn't guess. You wouldn't. You would never notice that going in. You wouldn't see it. No. You'd have to know it was back there, and you still wouldn't see it. But the, uh, the issues that are popping up. It's, it seems to me, a friend who who was recently bitten by a tick, and 24 hours later in the hospital, high fever, that sort of thing. The, the, these, is, that a, is it fair to say that that's an emerging area of concern, Lyme disease, for example? And then, how, and if it is, even if it isn't, I mean, how do you how do you deal with that? Well, um, so basically, let me say, start by saying that uh, I'm I've done a lot of work for probably the father of most of the mold, yeast, and Lyme disease um, issues that we we know about today. Um, Dr. Richie Shoemaker. Uh, he helped. He was the first guy to uh, really uh, understand and grasp the concept of biotoxins. It is now called chronic inflammatory response syndrome, and it can be to Lyme yeast and or mold disease. And many times, Lyme disease and mold disease go hand in hand. It's kind of difficult unraveling which is which, which came first. Um, focusing on Lyme disease. Lyme disease. When you get bit by a tick. Uh, from what my reading is, is that you can get um, up to 200 infections. And we used to just think it was ticks. Right. It's not just ticks anymore. Um, it can be it, mosquitoes. I think they found mosquitoes that are carrying some of these, 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 these um, uh, not all of the same diseases, but some of the same diseases. You've heard about the Zika virus. Um, it's, it seems like the environment is helped helping to deal us some new nasties uh, that we weren't anticipating or weren't expecting because the environment's changing, so they're going to change, and then we're going to get the result of that change. That's my, that's my theory. and It's not a fact. It's a theory. But so that in, in, in terms of your uh, training, the ongoing education, you're doing a lot of um, external communication, communicating and educating your customers, I would think. 
And physicians. And, and physicians. And physicians. The many times physicians will, like for example, the other day we had a patient, um, we had a physician uh, from uh, New Mexico uh, calling us up and saying, gee, this patient um, can't use a product that we invented called Beg Spray. Uh, it's a beg spray stands for uh, B stands for Bacterban, E stands for Ediate uh -huh. Sodium, and G stands for Gentamicin. It's just, it's just a, it's a beg spray. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a simple, it's a simple name to remember. Um, but they couldn't use the Gentamicin because uh, the infection wasn't uh, susceptible to it. So, what can we formulate? Now, the doctor wanted us to formulate the product so it had rifampin, but rifampin is not compatible with the mupirocin. So we had to figure out what else we could do. And so that's where the education of the physician came in. Because you know, when you look at the literature, oh yeah, well, let's put X with Y. And that'll, that'll be great. But X doesn't fit with Y. So you can't use it. And that's where we come in. How does the, how does the, the doctor in, in uh, New Mexico find Hopkinton drug? We, th we spend a fair amount of time, and this is what I spend the majority of my time with, is um, getting the word out about what we do. And uh, uh, we travel quite a bit around the country. We attend some of the top conferences on various disease states. Uh, uh, but seeing we're talking about Lyme and mold right now, um, we attend uh, a number of those conferences. We uh, meet doctors and patients at these conferences. We tell them about what we do. We build relationships. And, and over the years, um, um, through our efforts in doing that, we planted quite a number of seeds. And uh, it's a small community, if you will, although it's a large number of people, but they, they all travel in the same circles. And uh, one will speak to the next, and so on and so forth. And we'll start to get calls. Um, we do a lot of. Uh, emailing, uh, email blasts about our products and services. Um, we attend educational events with these folks. And, and essentially, uh, through getting the word out and building these relationships, um, we're able to further our message and help a lot more people. Would you, when you started, Dennis, did you ever think, you probably didn't think about this marketing effort. I mean, you. No, not at all. Not, 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 it wasn't, wasn't even on the radar. Mm. Um, I mean, my my focus was to, you know, be a good community pharmacist and try and meet patients' needs and educate our, our local folk as best we could and try and talk about nutrient depletions, which the regular pharmacy still does, uh, which is lacking. A lot of people are, are missing the boat on that. A lot of people aren't getting... Um, the good education that they should be getting about the medications they're taking, and they're, they're getting consequences for that. Um, but, you know, getting, getting back to the education, you know, a lot of physicians aren't aware as to even begin to address uh, some of these Lyme, mold, and yeast in, in, issues. Mm. Like, many people have um, a uh, coagulase-negative biofilm-forming staph in their infections, infections in their sinuses they haven't known about for decades. Uh, but yet they, their sinuses are always clogged up, they don't feel good, they get this little achy feeling, they think it's arthritis, or they can have foggy thinking, they're just thinking they're getting old. No, it's just a deep nose nasal culture. And then the next issue is, how do you get rid of it? Because it's not, it's not in your body, it's attached to your body. And, and a lot of doctors think that, okay, well, I'll give them a pill and we'll mm. get that, we'll give them an antibiotic and that antibiotic will solve it, but it doesn't solve it because it's not in the body, it's attached to the body. And uh, that's, that's, where, that's where doctors call us and say, you know, what should I do about this and how should I deal with that? So Hopkins and Drug is not a local drugstore? Well, we, yeah, we're, we're local, but we're also national. We also have a national presence. Uh, you know, we're not, we don't have a footprint like, you know, we're not a huge footprint, we're very niche but more and more doctors are calling us from across the country, can you do this, can you do that, um, is there a way, is there a way to, let's say, uh, uh, can you help us with uh, getting glutathione into, into our patients without having to hook them up to an IV, uh, or can you, can you make up a, um, uh, 
like vanidine, another, and this came from one of our patients. And one of our patients was, you know, my daughter hates the taste of this ranitidine that I have to give my child. And if you take a look at it, the ranitidine suspension or oral solution is loaded with alcohol. Why are we giving children under the age of one alcohol at all? Right. So we set out to figure out how to formulate it and without alcohol and make it taste good, and we achieved that. And um, it's it's one of the best products we've ever created. Really, and you take that that solution, and so I take the concept. The co yeah, okay. And then we get out there and educate the doctors about it. Um, you know, in in days gone by, we we still do a fair amount of this, where we'll we'll go out and and we'll have lunch meetings and give presentations at various hospitals and medical facilities, locally and around the country. Um, but uh, more often than not, we are able to attend certain conferences that are targeted uh, towards what we do, and uh, they may be attended by six, seven, eight hundred physicians. And uh, we'll we'll get a booth, and uh, we'll set up our banners, and and. Uh, um, the traffic is heavy and we get to, to talk to a lot of people and that's uh, essentially how we get the word out. Uh, it's a lot of work, it's a continuous effort. Um, if, if, you don't, if you're not at this all the time, uh, people will forget your name. Uh, other businesses will come along that do similar things and uh, we find that it's very important to maintain these relationships through the whole process. Yeah, uh, let me just add that, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, the word that gets out to these other physicians is because physicians are telling other physicians, this works. Mm. So, so that, that's, that's the best thing. Mm. That's, that's the best way. The, the trade shows are great and wonderful, but physician to physician saying, you know, this works, or patients saying to blogging about us uh, online, gee, we, we, uh, they really help meet our needs. The, um we, as we, when I started, I said this is, I don't think we can do all of this uh, in one session, and uh, I don't think we can, and we won't. So we need to, we, we, we really should continue this um, discussion, but before, bef uh, because I, I, I really want uh, to have you spend a little time on the lecture series. Um, I think it's uh, a very interesting concept. And you know, the other thing is, uh, the, the, you do stuff in the community uh, and have for years that uh, goes unnoticed. And I think we should spend, a, you know, we should spend some time on, on that as well. But uh, just in terms of wrapping up, let, let's talk a little bit about your lecture series, how it, how it came to be, and the kinds of variety of speakers that you've been able to assemble. Well, um, I mean, I'll start it off, but it's really, it's really Michael's baby. Um, I came up with the idea, and I said, "You know, we're, I was sitting at the sitting at the at my terminal, uh, and I had received like the eighth call about the same thing for the eighth time, and I'm just repeating the same thing over and over and over again. And it just dawned on me that's we need to get the word out. So I said, "Well, why don't we just have a group meeting and let doctors." tell the patients because many times physicians have more credibility in patients' eyes than, than we do. Um, and so, for example, we've had Dr. Shoemaker show up. He's been uh, one of the most popular speakers. Uh, Dr. Blanchard, Dr. Um, uh, J, Pat J. Um, but that's how it came, came about. So trying to get the word out to a lot of people so that the time wasn't getting chewed up saying the same thing over and over again. And then Michael took it from there. We, uh, with that idea and concept, uh, then we had to uh, design and build the series. Uh, so the first thing that I did is, uh, you know, we had some collaboration about what some interesting topics would be, what are concerning uh, people mostly, and uh, had to go out and find those physicians. Uh, they come, they, they don't get paid to speak. Um, it's pro bono, they, they volunteer their time. And the idea behind the series is that we wanna give back to our community. And 
what better way would there be uh, to have, I mean, we all visit the doctor. It's becoming more difficult to spend any time with our physicians these days. So uh, we thought that it'd be a great idea to be able to have a couple of hours of time and get all your questions answered, doesn't cost you anything, and learn some interesting things. We've had some great speakers through the years. Uh, I'll tell a quick story about one of them. I was watching 60 Minutes and I, I watched a story on a world-renowned geneticist named Aubrey Malunsky, Dr. Malunsky. <laughs> and I thought, what if I called his office to see if he would be a part of our series? So I did. I, go, I went online, found where he was. Uh, he's in Boston. His, his secretary or the person that ran the office told me that he, he flies around the world, speaks to large audiences, probably wouldn't be interested in what we were doing, but she would let him know. Um, probably within a couple of hours, I got a call from him personally. And he thought it was great that we were giving back to the community, thought that uh, you know a part of our business should be to do things like that, to help people. And he told me to keep him posted as to how the series went this, that year. And uh, the following year, he came and spoke. You know, I think, to me, um, the, the 30 minutes points, uh, the, the word I, I can't get out of my brain is uh, initiative, taking initiative. And I think that's what you've done at Hopping the Drug. You took initiative, both from your training, the, the, the continuing education and the work that you do with outreach. Um, that's taking initiative in the, in the lecture series is, uh, is another example. So I'd like to, uh, you know, on behalf of HCAM, thank you for taking the time. And I think we got to get you back. And I think that's where we ought to end today. So appreciate it, Dennis. Learned a lot. Have a greater appreciation for what, what you all do on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, we'll look forward to the next discussion. Look forward to it also. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tim Kilduff, and this is Business Matters. I think we got to talk a little bit about the history. I mean, uh, you were born into something pretty special, weren't you? Yeah. The shop is a, is a safe haven for a lot of people, young and old. Business Matters is HCAM's show focusing not only on businesses at Hopkinton, but more importantly, the people who run and manage those businesses.